Hello everyone. Today I'm going to talk about uh, the renal disorders, uh, the continuation of the blown blood disorders. We have completed the nephritic syndrome. Now I'm going to talk about the nephrotic and the primary disorders in that. Okay, so an overview of what I am going to talk, a recap of what I have said in the last class. The globular disease, microscopic features, nephritic syndrome, nephrotic syndrome, animal chain, membranous nephropathy, FSGS, membranous nephropathy, one and two. So, in the recap, I will start with what is glomerulus again. So, what is the structure of the glomerulus? I told you it's a tuft of capillaries uh, invested in double aero epithelium that is visceral and parietal epithelium. Has a glomerular basement membrane which is made of the collagen uh, polymers, right? So what it is uh, having is a non-collagenous domain one, the C terminal, which is important because it, it acts as an antigen in glomerular basement membrane disease. The visceral epithelial cells also proliferate in the reaction towards the glomerular injury. So uh, after knowing the basic uh, structure of the glomerulus, we got to know about the various immune mechanisms involved in glomerular pathology. That is immune mediated, antibody mediated, which is either in situ or circulating immune complex. In situ can be an antigen which is already present in the kidney or planted antigen which is, for example, like a infant cow's milk. If uh, that milk antigen can act as a, a, a antigen itself and then it can form an antibody and then antigen antibody complex uh, reactions take, takes place. So this is immune complex uh, type which is associated with an in situ type of uh, uh, reaction. Okay. And the other one is the circulating immune complexes. The circulating immune complexes can be exogenous or endo, uh, endogenous antigen reactions taking place with formation of an antibody. So we have an example of endogenous antigen like uh, systemic lupus, erythematosus or neonatal membranous nephropathy. Here we have uh, the exogenous uh, antigens uh, from various bacteria, virus, uh, something like that. Okay, so we have uh, a varied range of complex immune mechanisms that are happening to form an antigen antibody reaction that will accentuate the injury which is produced initially and then it is getting stabilized. Okay, so after once the disease is happening or taking place, which is injuring the most of the glomeruli or some of the glomeruli, the disease will progress. Uh, stably but not decrease with time though we kind of treat the initial uh, pathogen or initial antigen uh, if it is removed also the disease will exist in the process to progress into end stage renal disease okay it may take some years to form this so after this we have the i also spoke about the Heyman nephritis, which is a component of the immune uh, mediated, antibody mediated uh, injury that is taking place, you know, wherein, you know, that's uh, we have taken a rat as uh, the model, wherein megalin is probably the antigen which is creating the antigen antibody reaction. In uh, comparison to that, in humans, we have this phospholipase A2 receptor, you know, which acts as an antigen in membranous uh, nephropathy. So, we spoke about the glomerular structure, the immune mechanisms, whether it is antibody mediated now, like in C2, whether it is fixed or planted, or it can be a circulating immune complex resulting from an exogenous antigen or an endogenous antigen. So, after that, now it is time to discuss about the other pathways that is the cell mediated pathway wherein the sensitized T cells contribute to the glomerular injury and the alternate complement pathway which we see in the dense deposit disease that is membrane proliferative glomerular nephropathy type 2 wherein the accentuation of the disease is primarily contributed by the complement pathways. Okay, 
So this is about the immunological changes that happen when there is an injury to the glomerulus. So the cells which mediate this are either, either a part of kidney or the normal inflammatory cells or something like eicosanoids or soluble mediators. So coming to the cells which involved in this injury are the glomerular cells, the endothelial cells, the visceral epithelial cells and the parietal epithelial cells. All these cells can get proliferated, right? So the second point is that the leukocytes, which are the normal soldiers of a body, come into action and then they have their game uh, in the glomerular injury, right? So these cells will accumulate and uh, form the pathology of the glomerulus. And the other ones are the soluble mediators, where we call them as eicosanoids and, you know, the prostaglandins, which get secreted, uh, or the lipid... Uh, which gets, I mean, reabsorbed and then, you know, they're not shredded properly. And because of this, the glomerular pathology happens. So this is about the cells in the soluble mediators, which are forming a part of the glomerular pathology. Now coming to a specific term called as porocytopathy, wherein the visceral epithelial cells, there can be an effacement, that is a fusion of the visceral epithelial cells, or there can be a detachment of the visceral epithelial cells, where thereby there can be a plasma protein leak and thereby the proteinuria. So this is important in few diseases like FSGS and minimal change disease and diabetes, uh, diabetic nephropathy. Okay, the porocytopathy is the main uh, pathology which is related to these diseases. So you need to uh, remember this term called as porocytopathy which is the epi visceral epithelial cell damage, right? So after that, we have to know how does this glomerular injury progresses. This glomerular injury progresses in two forms, that is focal segmental glomerular sclerosis or a tubular interstitial injury. I told you what we mean by diffuse. The whole renal parenchyma is involved, that is diffuse, global, the entire one glomerulus is involved, that is global. And then segmental, a part of one glomerulus is involved, that is uh, segmental focal a fraction of the glomeruli in the kidney involved then it is called as focal so remember these terms which are very important now FSGS as you know it's focal a fraction of glomeruli segmental each part of the glomeruli a part of each glomeruli is involved so that is Focal segmented glomerular sclerosis that happens as a result of an epithelial damage. So because of that, the other glomerular try to come forward to help uh, the kidney function to keep up the renal function. So intraglomerular capillary pressure will increase, intraglomerular hypertension will increase. So because of that, there can be overall a hypertension and the reduction in the renal mass and it can progress to end stage renal disease as such. So this is one type where the glomerular injury will progress and the other one is a tubular interstitial injury that can happen either by the direct glomerular injury or the direct inciting agent or an antigen which is acting to cause a glomerular pathology. So this is about the glomerular injury. I told you this glomerular injury again because we are going to deep uh, into the renal parenchyma now, like you know. So after that, we have to know about the nephritic syndrome, then the nephrotic syndrome, right? So in the nephritic syndrome, we spoke about what it is. The first thing you have to remember in the nephritic syndrome is less than 3.5 grams per 24 hours protein urea is present. Hematuria can be present. Red cell casts are there. There can be oliguria, that is decrease in the renal output, less than 400 ml per 24 hours. Then there can be some azotemia as a result of reduced renal function. So remember these things, okay? So in the nephritic syndrome, we spoke about three things. One is acute glomerular nephritis relating to streptococcus and post-infectious, which is not related to streptococcus, but all the other infections that rapidly progress in glomerular nephritis. Okay, remember these three things, streptococcal, non-streptococcal, and rapidly progressing glomerular nephritis. Three things in the nephritic syndrome. 
Okay. So the first one is streptococcal. You have a sore throat. Usually the children, low socioeconomic class and overcrowding will be seen. Uh, on, only in these uh, uh, areas it is usually seen. Then you have the person will give you a history of all these things uh, with, uh, when he comes to you. Then it, if it is in adults, we can see the sensitized antibodies to a particular bacterial uh, thing can be seen. So in the adults, we can demonstrate the antibodies. Then uh, once we know the history, what we have to look for is that there is certain pathology that is taking place, right? There are some strains which are more common that is 12-4, one that are more commonly causing this uh, pathology. Then uh, what happens here is that the streptococcus antigen may get a uh, uh, form a planted antigen forms an immune complex reaction to antigen and antibody, you know, uh, and form an antigen antibody reaction. So what happens is that there will be a subendothelial deposit initially, and then as a result of the acute globular nephritis, there will be subepithelial humps, which are characteristics of this disease, which can be demonstrated in the immunoclarsins. So you can see that there is an immune complex deposition here happening as a subepithelial hum. This is characteristic of the acute nephritis as a result of streptococcus. In the post streptococcus or post infectious disease, it can happen as a result of something else other than streptococcus. Usually, we may not just see this IgG or deposits, we can see IgA deposits also sometimes in post infectious non streptococcal infection okay and the third one is rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis right so the progression is usually from hours to i mean days it can happen very quickly so what you have to remember it is uh, happening in three types like you know the first one is anti-gvm glomerular nephritis okay this anti-gvm glomerular nephritis can be renal limited only involvement of the globular basement membrane of the renal parenchyma or it can be associated with the lung. So if it is associated with the lung, it is called as good pastures. So here we see what circulating anti-GVM antibodies in the immunofluorescent we see the linear GVM staining for IgG. So if it is associated with lung hemorrhage with good pastures, without lung hemorrhage, just really limited is anti-GMN globular nephritis. In immune glo uh, complex globular nephritis, you know, the localization is important here, wherein the granular capillary or mesangial staining is seen uh, with immunofluorescence. So here, if it is IgA dominant with no vasculitis, it is called as IgA nephropathy. IgA dominant and systemic vasculitis is present along with that, it is inoxicondral perpetual. Systemic lupus erythematosus, we have told you that there can be subendothelial deposits, you know, the lupus nephritis. Acute streptococcal infection, acute post streptococcal glomerular nephritis, soaring to the sore throat and all, where we will see the subepithelial humps. Then thick capillary and endocapillary hypercellularity also is a feature of acute post streptococcal glomerular nephritis. Subepithelial dense deposits in a membranous glomerulopathy. I gave you an example of this as an antibody mediated in situ type of uh, reaction wherein the epithelial cell act as an antigen, right? So, other features, uh, many others are there, like you know, the diabetes and all. Then, coming to the other one that is anca glomerulonephritis, that is anti neutrophil, neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody. So, here we have no inflammation happening, you know, or uh, no leukocytes uh, are into the action uh, which are proliferating and causing the glomerular injury, but there is an antibody not to the visceral epithelial cell or uh, there is no antigen antibody reaction as such, but there is an antibody to the neutrophil. Either it can stain perinuclearly or it can stain cytoplasmically, thereby you divide the anchor into P anchor and C anchor, right? So here we see the circulating antibody with 
paucity of glomerular immunoglobulin stain, as I told you. So without lung hemorrhage, it is anchor glomerular nephritis. Vasculitis with no asthma and granulomas, it is microscopic polyangiitis. Granulomas with granulomatosis, eosinophilia, asthma and granuloma, Churchstrom syndrome. Just remember the main pathology of the glomerulus, then come to the nephritic syndrome. You have to remember only three things, streptococcus, non-streptococcal and RPGN. RPGN, again, you have to remember three things, anti-GBM. There is a glomerular basement membrane. Uh, the antigen is glomerular basement membrane. There is an antibody coming, attaching to it, forming immune complex. It is linearly stained. Associated with lung, without lung, then immune complex, glomerular nephritis, anca, glomerular nephritis, and the various types. So this is about the nephritic syndrome as such. So coming to the nephrotic syndrome. The nephrotic syndrome is caused by rearrangement in glomerular capillary walls resulting in increased permeability to plasma proteins. So this rearrangement of the nephrotic syndrome is caused usually by the cytokines and it is not usually uh, by anything else. So the cytokines will cause the change in the glomerular capillary walls. So the glomerular basement membrane, as you know, will act as a charge and size barrier, you know. The uh, filtrate which is passing to the glomerulus is uh, the filtration occurs because of the charge dependent barrier and the size dependent barrier. So what is happening in nephrotic syndrome? What is the pathogenesis? There is a glomerular damage. Then what happens? There is a permeability of capillaries to protein, which is increased. The proteinuria, initially it is less than or equal to 3.5 gram per 24 hours. Then there is hypoproteinemia as a result of it. The decreased plasma oncotic pressure, you know the proteins are important to maintain plasma oncotic pressure. Then fluid escapes into tissue as such and form the edema. Then because there is decrease in plasma volume, decrease in GF bar, there is increase in aldosterone secretion uh, in, with respect to this. And then the aldosterone, you know, the action of it is to retain salt and water, there is fluid retention and thereby edema. So we have the hyperventinemia also leading to complex synthesis of proteins which include the lipoproteins and then there will be hyperleptemia. So this is the pathogenesis of the nephrotic syndrome. Okay, so coming to uh, nephrotic syndrome, I told you there should be five things, right? One is uh, heavy proteinuria that is more than 3.5 gram per 24 hours, hyperlipidemia, hypoproteinemia, lipiduria, and severe edema, right? All the five things. So the heavy proteinuria, what it causes, obviously there is protein loss in the body, then, you know, the hypoalbuminemia is present. As such, decreased osmotic pressure, I told you the same thing, generalized edema. So this is uh, the pathology or pathogenesis, how the proteinuria is contributing to the injury or the pathology, what is happening. Okay, so because of that, what happens is that there is uh, activation of the sympathetic system and also there will be pitting edema. You know, the pitting edema is present because of the gen uh, edema which is caused by the sodium and water retention. Now, we have the stimulation of sympathetic system, I told you, and also reduction of the secretion of natriuretic factors such as atrial peptides. Okay. So, now coming to proteinuria. Usually, I told you, the glomerular basement membrane is trying to filter the thing which is coming uh, to it by the size dependent filtration and then the charge dependent filtration. Okay, so what is happening is that the highly selective proteinuria consists mostly of low molecular weight proteins and poorly selective proteinuria consists of high molecular weight proteins. So nephrotic syndrome may include initially a, a albumin or low molecular weight proteins which will be a going outside uh, in the form of the urine. But uh, in poorly selective uh, proteinuria, there can be globulins also which are uh, excreted. So what happens after, we have seen until now the protein part. Now coming to the lipid part, okay. There is increased synthesis of lipoproteins in the liver. You know, I told you because of hypoalbuminemia, the reaction is that there is increased secretion of proteins in that there are lipoproteins also. 
So then all these lipoproteins have to be properly segregated or transported. That is not happening here. So there is abnormal transport. Then the third one is decreased lipid catabolism. Okay, there is abnormal lipid breakdown. So because of that, what happens? Lipid gets accumulated in the vascular walls and all in the visceral epithelium. Then this causes thrombotic and thromboembolic complications. All these persons who are having hyperlipidemia may be prone to infections like staphylococcus and pneumococcus. Okay, usually the lipoproteins which are uh, in the urine should be reabsorbed. Okay, and then they are secreted by the tubular epithelial cells. But once there is an injury, these uh, uh, lipoproteins will be shedded. Then what happens? They form the oval fat bodies. So in the micro, a urine microscopy, if you are finding these oval fat bodies, then it is a uh, sign of hyperlipidemia and lipiduria. Okay. So, the nephrotic syndrome can occur at what age? It can occur in childhood, it can occur in adults. Okay, in the childhood, usually the most common thing is when one change in the adults, we can see that uh, there can be membranous uh, nephropathy, which is the most common thing. Now, the nephrotic syndrome sometimes responds to steroids and sometimes it doesn't. The progression is finally to the end stage renal disease in the form of the chronic renal failure, if the renal function is continuously impaired. Okay, so this is uh, the uh, pattern of presentation of the nephrotic syndrome. We said now, the, uh, until now, we spoke about the definition what is nephrotic syndrome and the pathogenesis of the proteinuria and lipidemia, hyperlipidemia, how it is happening and contributing to the renal pathology. Now, the causes of nephrotic syndrome can be primary globular diseases, which can be occurring only uh, limited to the renal, renal disease, or it can be associated secondary to a systemic disease like diabetes, amyloidosis, SLE, infections, malignant disease, etc. Okay. So we'll come to the first one that is a membranous nephropathy. In membranous nephropathy, there is diffuse thickening of the capillary wall due to accumulation of deposits containing immunoglobulins along the subepithelial side of the basement membrane. See, all these uh, topics of membranous nephropathy or uh, the primary disorders like the membranous minimal chain, FSGS and MPGN. These are the four things which I'm going to talk right now. And all the things what I'll be talking will have a definition like how it is presenting. That's one. The age of presentation. Okay. Pathogenesis. Then I'll go into the details of the clinical morphology. Then clinical features and the prognosis. Right. So all these diseases now will be discussed under these settings. Membranous nephropathy, minimal change, FSGS, NPGN 1 and 2. That is... Uh, the dense deposit this is type 2. These things I discuss now under the headings of uh, definition, age, then the pathogenesis, the morphology, the clinical features and problems, right? Just here. So I have already told you by discussing the structure of the glomerulus and how the disease is produced. You know, then I have told you that there will be sub-epithelial side of immune complex deposition in membranous nephropathy. Okay, there are two types. The primary, the primary is the one in which the renal uh, parenchyma is directly involved or the secondary uh, disease is produced as a result of all these things. That is drugs. You know, when a person is having rheumatoid arthritis, he'll be treated with certain non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs along with that. The person may take pencil, mind, captopril, and gold. All these things will cause, will be a secondary cause for the, produ uh, for the production of the membranous uh, nephropathy. Underlying malignant tumors, systemic lupus erythematosus. You know, in the lupus nephritis, we have different classes in that Membranous nephropathy is one. Infections like chronic hepatitis B, hepatitis C, syphilis, cystosomiasis, malaria, other autoimmune diseases such as thyroiditis, 
uh, associated with second membrane is nephropathy. So the age which the membrane is nephropathy is usually seen as 40 to 70 years old people. It is either primary or secondary. Secondary causes the chest nerve have LCA. Now coming to the pathogenesis. This is an immune complex mediated disease which can be associated with the HLA ELIS, usually HLA DQ A1. Okay. And the uh, antigen, I told you while discussing about the Heyman nephritis, I told you that there is an adult model. In Heyman, the megalin is what the antigen is about. And then here we have this phospholipase A2 receptor, which is acting as an antigen to which the antibody comes and binds. So we have a fixed antigen, antibodies coming and binding. And then there is an in situ immune complex formation as a result of the antigen antibody reaction. So because of this, what happens? There is paucity of the inflammatory cells. Not all the inflammatory cells are weak now. They are not coming into action and playing an important role to heal of the inflammation. So what is helping in it? So there are some uh, complement factors and immunoglobulins which are trying to uh, seal, seal it off. And then what happens is that there will be some glomerular epithelial cells which react to it and uh, produce proteases and oxidases to combat or destroy this immune complex, which is already formed because of the phospholipase A2 uh, receptor. So once the immune complex is formed, this uh, oxidases and proteases produced by the other uh, cells are trying to destroy this immune complex. So because of that, there will be damage to the capillary wall and then there is leaky capillary wall. And whenever there is a leaky capillary wall, what happens? The protein comes out. So because of that, there is proteinuria. And the membrane attack complex, the C5B scene had come into action and then it will have a major role in uh, the disruption of it. Then the subclass of immunoglobulin G and immunoglobulin G4, which are very poor activators of the complement still are known to get deposited in this disease. So what you have to know is, in any glomerular pathology, there is an antigen, either fixed or augmented or circulating, which has an antibody reaction. So once the immune complex is formed, something is trying to destroy it. Okay, even that destruction, you know, which is trying to protect, you know, even that destruction is causing the destroying the immune complex is also causing the glomerular pathology. So in that way, there is a leaky capillary wall. So here you can see this silver methamine stain wherein you can see this thick uh, basement membrane. Here you can see the spikes which are present. Okay. In the morphology, usually I discuss the membrane nephropathy in the form of Again, three headings. In the light microscopy, you find the thick basement membrane. Okay. In the electron microscopy, here you can see there is a subepithelial uh, region. The podocytes are getting uh, the subepithelial region. You can see the deposits. Okay. So, again, the immunofluorescence, wherein you can see the C3 glandular appearance in the immunoglobulin deposition here in the form of granular deposits, right? So, any morphology in the kidney, you have to discuss it under three headings again. One is the light microscopy here in membranes. It is thickened basement membrane. The, what, what is the other thing? The electron microscopy, the sub-epithelial uh, hums or the membranous hums, uh, which are uh, seen. Uh, or here we see the epimembranous deposits, but in uh, acute glomerular nephritis, we see the subepithelial humps. In the immunofluorescence, we see the granular immunofluorescence as a result of the immune complex deposition of C3 and immunoglobulin. So here we see there is th this is the illustrating diagram where you can see the thickened basement membrane and the deposits under the epithel uh, epithelium with the effaced food processes. Okay, effacement is nothing but the fusion. Okay, this is about the membranous nephropathy. So, how does it progress? The progress is associated with sclerosis of glomeruli, rising serum creatinine level, which will cause renal efficiency, uh, insufficiency, 
and development of hypertension. So what is happening here is that there is a progression which is associated with, see this is a form of nephrotic syndrome, right? So you see the features of nephrotic syndrome with proteinuria, okay? And then hematuria is usually seen in 10% of the cases. There can be sclerosis associated with it and then the renal insufficiency can happen. Okay, so this membranous nephropathy will not respond to corticosteroids. So there is a development of hypertension. So this is about the prognosis of the membranous nephropathy once we get. So coming to the minimal change disease. The first one I'll talk about is the definition that is relatively benign disorder. Diffuse assessment of food process of Israel epithelial cells detectable only by electron microscopy in globular that appear virtually normal by light microscopy. So the change is according to the term, it is minimal. Only on electron microscopy, you will be finding the defect, okay? The light microscopy, you do not see any defect. And the age group, which is most commonly affected here is two to six year old children. And then there can be an adult form of minimal change disease also, but usually this is seen in children. Okay, now coming to the pathogenesis. In the pathogenesis, we know that the minimal change disease is having some immunological basis because there is a previous respiratory infection or there by the response to the corticosteroids, they respond very well to the corticosteroids. So because of that, we may think that there is an immune basis. It is usually associated with atopic disorders. There is a HLA association with it. The persons with Hodgkin's lymphoma, usually the adults also, the persons who are having minimal change uh, type of disease is usually associated with Hodgkin's lymphoma. So in membranous nephropathy, we have an antigen called as phospholipase A2-receptor. So there is a hypothesis that there is an antigen, something like angiopoietin like 4, okay? which is a candidate pathogenic factor that is acting as an antigen. This is a hypothesis. It's not completely proved. So there is a, what is happening here is a visceral epithelial cell injury. So this is the pathogenesis. What happens when there is an antigen antibody reaction or visceral epithelial cell injury? Whenever there is a visceral epithelial cell injury, the first change we see is the effacement of the food processes. Okay, because of that, what happens? There is this plasma protein leak. This plasma protein leak may be in the form of a transcellular passage that is passively just moving out or by the residual spaces which are formed because of the detached epithelial cells. So th this may be the pathogenesis which is involved in the minimal change disease. So in the microscopy, again, I told you that I'll be discussing at the three headings, light microscopy, electron microscopy, and immunofluorescence. In the light microscopy, we will not be able to see any of the globular looks absolutely now. In the electron microscopy, what we will see is that there will be effacement, that is the fusion of these food processes. Okay, that is the important characteristic finding what we will see by electron microscopy. In addition to this, there is something called as lipoid nephrosis, which is related to the tubules in the minimal change disease, wherein the lipid secretions which are there, they get, they, uh, they get uh, accumulated there and then they form something called as lipoid nephrosis. This can be seen in conjunction along with the effacement of the food processes. Okay, this is happening in the globulin that is happening in the tubules. So, in the immunofluorescence, again, the third one, in the immuno, we will not be able to find any change. There is no deposit, okay? So, in membranous nephropathy, we will see the C3 and IgG deposits in, in the form of the granular deposits, okay? So, just see the change. In membranous nephropathy, what is the antigen? In minimal change, what is the antigen? You know, you should be reading it like that, okay? So now coming to the third one, that is focal segmented globular sclerosis, which is usually a cluster of diseases, which is usually either primary or it can be associated with, again, 
The second is a called HIV infection, heroin addiction, sickle cell disease, massive obesity. Okay. As I told you, focal means only a fraction, segmental, a part of the wilderness. Remember this. It can occur as an adaptive response to some injury that is happening because of some other thing. That is an IG nephropathy, okay, or a unilateral regensis or renal dysplasia and hypertensive nephropathy, wherein there is reduction in the uh, uh, renal cell mass. So this is about the FSGS. Again, what are the age groups which are involved? It can be again seen in the children or it can be seen in the adults. So what is happening here? There is a genetic association. Okay, what is the genetic association is that there can be mutations in the borders in alpha actin 4 and TRPC6. I, and also the nephrin. Okay. I told you in the slit diagram why I was expect, uh, uh, explaining you the epithelial food process, the integrity of the visceral epithelium on the photocytes are maintained by the nephrin, which is an extracellular molecule which is bound by the intracellular intracytoplasmic photosyn and again actin filaments, right? You remember that picture? So, if there is a mutation in codosin alpha actin 4 and TRPC6, what happens? There will be an epithelial cell damage. Okay. So because there is an epithelial cell damage occurring, what happens is that there is a proteinuria as such. So this proteinuria happens in terms uh, because of the uh, mutations either in the molecules which are uh, helping in the integrity of the epithelial food processes uh, and this after there is a damage to the epithelium what happens is that there is an entrapment of the plasma proteins and then there will be a protein leak and because of this there will be high gnosis wherein the plasma proteins will get insulated and then they can block the capillary wall hyalinosis and then the fibrin strands will come to the rescue so there will be sclerosis with extracellular matrix deposition. So this is the pathogenesis of the FSGS. So either it can occur in children or adults, usually it can be primary or secondary, and then there is an adaptive response. And in the pathogenesis, we have this mutations in nephrin, podosin, alpactin 4, and TRPC6 which may or not just this but circulating immune complexes or the genetic mutations any of these can cause the globular damage and because of that there will be entrapment of the protein and because of that plasma protein leak they can lead to hyalinosis and extracellular matrix deposition with fibrin strands leading to sclerosis okay this is a pathogenesis involved in FSGS. now if there is a mutation in nephrin Okay, the gene which codes for nephrin is NPHS1 gene and if there is a mutation in that gene, there will be the congenital nephrotic syndrome which is happening which is usually of a Finnish type in will change uh, thing. Okay, so just remember this, uh, if it is in the nephrin, it, it causes congenital nephrotic syndrome. Okay, and second one is NPHS2. Okay that codes for podosin and then it causes steroid resistant uh, nephrotic syndrome okay nphs1 congenital nephrotic syndrome nphs2 steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome okay if there is an uh, mutation in trpc6 this is a channel which is important for the calcium so the flux of the calcium will be present here so remember that then alpha actin in 4 in the alpha actin 4, if there is a mutation, that it can cause uh, autosomal dominant type of uh, focal segmental uh, globular uh, sclerosis. Also, there is an association with EPO lipoprotein 1. So, these are all the genetic changes which contribute to the formation of the FSGS. Okay, after pathogenesis, we'll go to the morphology. Okay. So before that, we'll see, I just told you these are the nephrin molecules, this extracytoplasmic, which is associated with the podosin, the active filaments, which maintain the integrity of this food process. So any lost in 
loss and disintegrity, there will be a plasma protein leak. And then there is hyaline or plasma protein secretion and hyaline formation. And to uh, combat this, there will be extracellular matrix deposition. So what happens is that there is an epithelial damage that is a photocytopathy, then effacement, like just like that of the minimal changes is hyaline sclerosis. Okay, progressive glomerular sclerosis and renal failure may be the thing which which can uh, happen due to this. Then IgM and C3 are the ones which are getting deposited. So what are the clinical features? The clinical features are hematuria, reduced GFR and hypertension. Non-selective proteinuria, poor response to corticosteroid therapy and progression to the chronic kidney disease. Within 10 years, the patient may actually go into the end-stage renal disease where the GFR is less than 5%. So, age group, children or adults, it can be genetic mutation, SO3, NPG is 1, 2, that is nephrine, polosin, alpha actin, 4, TRPC6, apolipoprotein 1, Right, or it's uh, immune complex which can cause photocytopathy. That is a pathogenesis. After there is a photocytopathy, what happened? The morphology. Okay. So now we're coming to the morphology, we have three glomerular here, 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 one, two, and three. Okay. And the third one you can see it is different from all, all the other two. Here we can see this is the sclerosis. Okay. This is a part of the glomerular which is affected, that is segmental type. Okay, this is the hyper picture again. We can see here, this is affected part of the glomerular, glomerulus. Here we can see the hyalinoxis. Okay, so before going to the collapsing type, I told you the clinical features, hematuria, reduced GFR and hypertension. In minimal change disease, there is no hypertension or hematuria. Okay, there is only very, very mild proteinuria which can be seen. Okay, but here we can see hematuria and hypertension. Okay, though in minimal change disease, massive proteinuria, whenever it is also, it can be reversible and responds excellently to corticosteroids. Here, we have non-selective proteinuria, poor response to corticosteroid therapy. But in minimal change disease, the response to corticosteroid therapy is excellent. The progression to chronic kidney disease is uh, high in FSGS, uh, with the almost 10% of them reaching to the chronic kidney disease and then end stage renal disease. Okay, so just uh, know the differences: antigen, antibody reaction, how it is taking place, and what is leading to what. Okay, so light microscopy, we are seeing the focal segmental, you know, hyalinosis here and then sclerosis. In the electron microscopy of the uh, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, we see the effacement of the food process uh, exactly like that of the minimal change disease. Okay, there can be some maculation associated with the visceral epithelial cells. Then in the immunofluorescence, or we, we see this IgM and C3 deposits. In membranous technopathy, again, we see the IgG and C3 deposits. In the granular form here, it's the same in the form of IgM and C3 deposits in the immunofluorescence. Whereas in minimal change disease, I told you there are no deposits and then there is no change in the light microscope. Okay. Now coming to the collapsing type. Whenever we say collapsed, you know, the glomerulus gets retracted, it gets collapsed, it may be due to infection, thrombotic microangiopathies, post-infectious glomerular nephritis. Okay, it is usually also seen in HIV nephropathy. Okay, in HIV nephropathy, what happens is the tubular reticular endothelial cells also get uh, proliferated and uh, they may form some inclusion type, uh, type of thing which is very characteristic of HIV. Uh, the pathogenesis of collapsing nephropathy is usually unclear. So collapsing nephropathy can happen not only HIV, but other infections. But HIV is one of the classical example of collapsing nephropathy. So here we can see this collapsing glomerulopathy here, you can see. 
this is the retracted uh, the glomerulus and then this is a visible retraction here you know this is these are the inclusions uh, what we see here this is the classical example of the uh, glomerulopathy which is a collapsing type usually seen in uh, hiv uh, patients okay so just at a glance what we have uh, done until now post infectious glomerulonephritis nephritic syndrome pathogenesis i told you immune complex mediated circulating or planted antigen light microscopy diffuse endocapillary proliferation leukocytic infiltration is there and then fluorescence igg secret deposits in the gvm and mesangium glandular iga in some cases electron microscopy sub epithelial hum sub endothelial deposits in early stages good pastures i told you anti gvm extra capillary proliferation with crescents crescents when when we call it as crescents even in rapidly progressing glomerular nephritis we see this crescents and uh, uh, gps is one of the form of uh, the rpgn Wherein we see the crescents are usually because of proliferating parietal epithelial cells. Remember that parietal epithelial cells, no necrosis. Then there is linear IgG and C3, and no deposits and GVM di disruption and electron microscopy. You see the fibrin stains. Chronic glomerular nephritis, which we'll be dealing later, result in chronic linear failure, high dense glomeruli, immunofluorescence. It can be granular or negative. then membranous nephropathy is a part of mem membranous minimal change and fsg is part of nephrotic syndrome i told you the antigen pla2 phospholipase a2 receptor minimal change loss of glomerular poly and uh, anion and it is polycyte injury that is happening here fsg is we have this unknown uh, uh, pathogenesis i told you the fsgs there can be epithelial damage as a result of uh, some unknown thing right so what is happening there is something called as renal ablation okay this renal ablation uh, type of uh, fsgs is usually secondary to unilateral renal agenesis or reflex uh, nephropathy remember that and then we see what in the light microscope we see focal segmented sclerosis cyanosis igm and c3 will get deposited there are loss of food process and epithelial denudation all these things will contribute to the proteinuria which is uh, in uh, uh, relation to the nephrotic syndrome now coming to the mpg and 1 mpg and 2 and ign nephropathy will be dealing these things now so mpg and 1 nephrotic immune complex mediated mesangio proliferative mesangio capillary they call it there can be gvm thickening or splitting which gives it as tram track appearance like there is one glomerular basement membrane i told you in response to the proliferation there can be formation of another membrane so it appears as a tram track okay so what is getting deposited here igg c3 c1q and c4 Okay, there are subendothelial deposits. In dense deposit cases, there is usually in hematuria and chronic renal failure. It is usually an alternate complement pathway. See, I told you while I was discussing about the pathogenetically immune mediated mechanisms of the glomerular injury. I told you that can be associated with antibody, it can be associated with cell mediated, or it can be an alternate complement pathway. So the third type of immune mediated injury is only seen in the dense deposit cases where there is mesangial proliferative pattern of proliferation can be uh, splitting here we see the c3 no c1q or c4 in the form of immunofluorescence in the form of dense deposits ign nephropathy will be dealing with later so now membrane of proliferative there are two types one is uh, primary and the uh, sorry one is type 1 and the other one is type 2 that is a dense deposit cases why is it happening is that because there is alteration in the glomerular basement membrane with the proliferation of glomerular cells leukocyte infiltration and presence of deposits in mesangial and cap glomerular capillary walls see basically membrane proliferative is otherwise called as mesangio capillary remember that if you know 
that there is something which is getting deposited in the mesangium and capillary can you remember this so this deposit is result of what then you can know that there is some proliferation of glomerular cells and the leukocytes which are coming into action and then there will be alteration in the glomerular basement membrane remember all this is like that so what is uh, happening here is that see this is the silver stain which is trying to show us the duplication here of the glomerular basement membrane okay there is this increased mesangial matrix okay and then mesangial cell proliferation then the basement this is the splitting what you can see here here okay though so, so there is the swelling of the cell capillaries okay okay there is swelling of the capillaries so all these things are the changes what we find in the light microscopy so we are find, finding some leukocytes which are there and then there can be some um, thickening of the glomerular basement membrane that can be seen and increase mesangial matrix this can be seen by the light microscopy but in the electron microscopy we can see the exact split we can also see the uh, membrane uh, segmental splitting of uh, the thing okay so in the immunofluorescence we can see the granular type of deposition of the complement and the immunoglobulin so here we are trying to illustrate the membrane of proliferative glomerular nephritis type 1 type 2 here we are seeing sub endothelial deposits and then here in the type 2 we are finding the intramembranous deposits okay so coming to the progression of the after uh, by the way the age group which is involved is usually the young and uh, adolescents and young adults in membrane of proliferative glomerular nephritis okay and then we find uh, i have spoken about the pathogenesis and uh, the uh, complement uh, mediate mediation and here we will talk about the morphology the morphology i told you the tram track appearance and the hypertrophy of the glomeruli increase in the mesangial matrix and the proliferating uh, cells now we will talk about the secondary mbgn that is usually associated with chronic immune complex diseases alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency and malignant diseases so what is happening here is that there is hypocomplementinemia there is decreased synthesis of complement by the liver okay as a result there is absolutely no functioning of the complement in uh, irrespective of that the c3 and propertin get deposited in the uh, uh, basement membrane okay basement membrane of the glomerulus because of that what happens but the c4 others are normal okay c3 gets decreased and the propertin get decreased okay so you know that the alternate complement pathway if you remember the inflammation chapter what happens the c3 gets cleaved whenever there is an endotoxin at bacterial lipopolysaccharides you know that cleaves c3 directly and then there is formation of the c3 bbb okay and for this to happen there is something called as uh, usually the c3 b is usually the uh, lebel it is not stable but if there is the c3 uh, uretic factor then what happens this nephrotic factor the c3 nephrotic factor is trying to stabilize this part so because there is a continuous action of the c3 and then this gets uh, deposited so because of this what happens there is a complement uh, deposition here in dense deposit tissues usually the corticosteroid therapy is not uh, working very well in membrane proliferative glomerular nephritis we are seeing the subendothelial deposits here usually uh, the progression is variable sometimes it may take years to uh, go into the end stage renal disease sometimes it is uh, uh, having a slow progression so you have to remember all the four what i have told you here 
one is a fifth one is the subtype if you take it as four or five so major four types one is membranous nephropathy remember the antigen phospholipase a2 receptor then we have to remember that there is sub epithelial deposits okay the second one minimal change no uh, deposit formation no change in light microscopy only podocytopathy okay then the third one fsgs uh, non pathogenesis we have the other variant called collapsing okay and the epithelial damage resulting in hyaluronic sclerosis you know that can be visualized in light microscopy uh, and uh, the <coughs> electron microscopy fourth one membrano proliferative order also called as mesangio capillary where the deposits can be seen in mesangio okay in the form of uh, dense uh, layer also it can be seen in lamina densa that is different from the deposits which are see uh, uh, the immunoglobulin deposits okay here we are seeing these types of uh, nephrotic syndrome in the next class we will see the systemic diseases associated with the nephrotic syndrome thank you i hope you are trying to classify the things in terms of age okay in terms of clinical features in terms of pathogenesis in terms of the light microscopy electron microscopy and the special stain and uh, uh, the immunofluorescence then prognosis if you read under these subhead subheadings it will be easier for you to reproduce when you are reproducing it in an exam okay thank you tomorrow we'll deal about the other ones thanks